Hi, Year 12s. Today in this video, I'm going to take you through sections one, two, and three of the parts that we're looking at in detail for part two of Ransom. Um, so I'm just doing these three together because they're quite short. Um, the other ones will have their own videos just for those parts that we're looking at later on. So we'll start with um, the first little section. So as you can see, I've kind of outlined each one uh, with the gray on the side there. Um, also, this is my scans of my actual copy of the book. So you can see all of my annotations that are already in there. I'll talk you through those and we'll also add to those. Um, I'd really recommend that you be reading along in your copy as we're doing, as you're watching this video and you're adding notes and highlighting quotes and that kind of thing as we go through, um, just to make sure that you have those things written down in your own words. All right. The grief that racks him is not only for his son Hector, it is also for a kingdom ravaged and threatened with extinction, for his wife Hecuba and the many sons and daughters and their children who stand under his weak protection, and for Troy, once a place of refinement and of ceremonies pleasing to the gods, now in the waking dreams that night after night trouble his rest, a burnt out shell whose citizens, though they believe themselves quietly asleep and safe in their beds, are the corpses he moves among, headless, limbless, savagely hacked, hovered about by ghostly exhalations and the fires of the dead. Flies cluster at their nostrils and the corners of their eyes. Dogs lick up the spatter of their brains, gnaw at their shoulder bones and skulls and on the small bones of their feet. Above, among towering smoke trails, birds of prey hang waiting for the dogs to be done. Okay, so this is about Priam's grief, first of all, for his son Hector. Um, so obviously that's, you know, in the first line. So the, the grief that he feels for Hector, but this is also about the grief that he feels for his kingdom and for his wife, for his sons and daughters and their children and for Troy. Okay, so we kind of start small and we build up into this bigger picture. So he... We start off small, we start with the, the grief that he feels for Hector, but then we also get a glimpse into how Priam deals with um, the losses that other people experience. So he feels directly responsible for the, uh, the livelihoods of his family, which kind of makes sense, um, but also for Troy, again, which makes sense because of his role, but we can see that the, the toll um, that this is taking on him here. So... He describes himself um, as a leader that has a kind of weak protection. Um, his kingdom is described as ravaged and threatened with extinction. Um, and then he describes Troy as once a place of refinement and ceremonies pleasing to the gods. So here he's talking about the Troy that he um, believes in, the Troy that he thinks of uh, when he thinks of Troy, the Troy that used to be. And now because of the war, he's comparing that with the Troy that he sees now. So um, this is talking about the dreams that he has about Troy. And he says, he describes the citizens as believing themselves quietly asleep and safe in their beds. Um, and he is kind of showing that, you know, the citizens think that they're safe because he is there and the army is there and they, you know, have this illusion of protection and he's the one who's protecting them. But he feels as though he is not adequately protecting um, his citizens. And because of that, he is seeing them as corpses. So he's seeing the death that is going to come for these people. So he describes them as um, corpses who are kind of walking around. The dogs are basically eating these people as they're walking around, um, which, you know, it, it invokes this sense of decay in Troy and the sense that, um, you know, while these people think that everything's fine, he knows the reality and he knows that things are not okay. And then he finishes off this description with birds of prey hang waiting for the dogs to be done so he feels kind of hopeless he's it's like once the dogs are done eating his people um and the city of troy is completely ravaged even then there won't be peace there's still something else that's going to attack and something else that he's going to feel like he needs to protect his people from so this is giving us a real insight into priam's uh life um as a as a man and the um the protection that he feels over his family and the grief that he feels for what his family is going through but also it shows the sense of responsibility that he has to Troy and to being a good leader 
Okay, we're going to move on to section two now. So this part goes uh, from here all the way over the page to here. Okay, he's obliged in his role as king to think of the king's sacred body. This brief six feet of earth he moves and breathes in, aches and sneezes and all, as at once a body like any other and an abstract of the lands he represents, the living map. Holding in his head all the roads that lead out to the distant parts of his kingdom, he feels them at times as ribbons tied, to, tied at the centre of him, for the most part loose, but sometimes stretched taut and pulling a little, according to what is occurring out there. Events that his body is, is aware of as a dim foreboding long before the last in a relay of messengers, who for days have been running down dusty roads, bursts in to deliver it as news. He has two or three times during his reign gone with a train of companions on a progress through his far-flung territories to show himself and to see a little of what is out there that he represents. That his more usual role is to stand still at the centre, both actual and symbolic in the same breath, and to experience those dual states quite naturally as one. Okay, so this starts off talking about Priam's role and who he perceives himself to be as the figurehead, the leader of Troy. Okay, so he is obliged to think of the king's sacred body. Okay, so he's talking about himself here, but he's talking about obligation and the king's sacred body. He's talking about himself um, and his, his role as a person as quite removed from who he is. Um, and he describes himself as at once so a body like any other but also an abstract of the lands he represents and their living map so he is talking about how he is simultaneously a normal person who has a family who has wants and needs and fears and so on but also as a representation of the land itself and the whole culture and the whole civilization then um if we look at this uh, little summary, oh, sorry, this little section at the end here. So he's saying two or three times he's gone with the train of companions and, um, you know, had a look around at what he represents, but he's not really involved in that life. He's there as a spectator and as someone who is a figurehead. He's a representation of this culture and these people, but he is not, um, he's not, to them and to people outside of himself, really, he's not a real person. He is um, symbolic, but he knows that he's, you know, an actual person as well. He's, he is the epitome of what a Trojan is, um, but it is symbolic. It's not, um, it's not something that you can really, it, it, he is not engaging with life in the way that he um, sees people when he goes on these um, these progressions to his far-flung territories. So this is talking about his role as a human and as a man, but also as a leader and the, the juxtaposition between those two preems that exist. Um, this is a really good passage to look at when we actually get to analysing the Queen. Come back and look at this description, particularly this last little bit that I've highlighted in blue. The idea of standing still at the centre centre, um, and being symbolic. Okay, let's go to the third little section, which is just this little part here. So, yes, yes, he thinks. All this I know is unprecedented. But so is his plan. This plunging at near dawn down a deserted corridor is just the beginning. He will get used to the unaccustomed. It is what he is after. He feels bold now, defiant, sure of his decision. If he is to face Hecuba and prevail, he has to be. Okay, so this is where we start to see um, the theme of change taking place and starting to really permeate into Prem's character. So um, obviously we are a little bit fatigued of the word unprecedented, but basically he is saying, I know that this isn't normal. This is out of character. This is not part of the tradition um, that we as Trojans um, kind of hold ourselves to. But he's saying this plan is unprecedented. So I have to be as well. Everything that I'm thinking and doing is unprecedented. But he he's saying that this is what he's after. He's going to get used to things that he's not accustomed to, getting used to the unaccustomed. He's embracing change 
and he's actually seeking out change. It's what he's after. And this, this realization is the thing that makes him bold and defiant. Okay. He's emboldened by his own ability to enforce change. He, he sees this in himself and he's excited by it. He isn't shying away from the possibility of change. He's actually saying this could be a really good thing. This is new and yeah, it might be dangerous, but this is exciting. Um, and that's where we're going to leave this video of sections one, two, and three.